Well, good morning. Hope you uh, had a happy Thanksgiving. Hope it was a good weekend for you. Um, we uh, came into town yesterday evening. We were visiting friends, uh, longtime friends uh, out of state, and uh, came back last night. And um, uh, I'm probably not going to be moving a lot this morning. I tweaked my back yesterday, and we did the absolute worst thing you can do when you do that is go on a long road trip <laughs> right, right after that. Some of you have probably done that before. Uh, not, not pleasant, so uh, maybe not quite as animated this morning, but that's okay. I'm thankful that we still have a pulpit. Some churches have kind of gotten away from that. It's heavy enough to support you here a little bit, so we'll stay here this morning and, and we'll get through this. So, Well, it was a, was a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving for our family and I hope you're gearing up for Christmas. Um, certainly a... Uh, a great way to spend the Christmas season, right? Praising the Lord together. That's a, a great thing for us to do. We are uh, continuing in a series that we started about two weeks ago in uh, the Gospel of Luke, and uh, the timing worked out well, so we'll be covering the passages that uh, speak about the birth of Jesus Christ right around uh, the Christmas season. And so uh, it's wonderful that we have the chance to do this together. Let's, uh, let's take our 60 seconds of prayer as we often do, or usually do, um, 60 seconds silently, and then I'll close us. Gracious Lord, we pray this morning that you would be honored and that your church would be edified, that your gospel would go forth this morning as we open your word together. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. What does the word impossible mean to you? Right? You hear the word impossible. Is that really many times I think when we hear that word, we th we're, th we're actually thinking of highly improbable, right? We say impossible. But we think highly improbable. This often happens in the world of sports. You'll hear, oh, such and such is impossible. This is never going to happen. And then, lo and behold, at some point, it actually happens. I was watching a football game a few weeks ago with some friends we were visiting. Um, and uh, we were sitting on a couch watching this. And it was the very end of a game. And the guy lined up to kick a field goal. And it was a 62-yard field goal, which if you know anything about football, that's pretty far. Um, it's, it's not impossible, but it is highly improbable. And my thought was, no way. This is no way the guy's going to make this. It's going to overtime. And lo and behold, the guy actually made the kick and he proved me wrong. And so, again, I said impossible. It turned out to be highly improbable, but it actually happened. But as we look in our, our text today, we see some things here that are flat out impossible. Okay, these things simply can't happen, at least from a human perspective. But when we're talking about God, that's a game changer. Okay, He's the creator uh, of the universe. He can do as He pleases. In fact, if He can create the universe with a mere word, He can breathe man, life into man from the dust, uh, form him from the dust and breathe life into him. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead and perform all other manner of things that we see as miraculous. God can do as He pleases, right? All things are possible with Him, or as it was said in the text this morning, nothing will be impossible with God. And so as we're looking, that's the title of our text this morning, it comes there uh, from verse 37, uh, nothing will be impossible with God. And really, that's the principle 
uh, as we start to look at our points, that's the principle that, that really is the, the, the undergirding foundation uh, of everything we're going to look at this morning. Nothing will be impossible with God. Uh, or we could say it another way, nothing is impossible for God. Right? Nothing is impossible for Him. Verse 37 is not the only place that we see that principle articulated in Scripture. Even later in the book of Luke, we see it stated in another, another way. Luke chapter 18, verse 27. But He, capital He, meaning Jesus, but He said the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Again, the principles there are very basic. God can do as He pleases, right? Nothing is impossible with Him. Now, the context there in that text, and we're going to talk about this more later in the sermon, is uh, who can be saved, right? Uh, the, the, the disciples are like, well, if this is the case, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, well, nothing is impossible with God. He can do uh, whatever He pleases, and it's said this way, it's said this thought is conveyed in other ways throughout the Scriptures. For instance, back in the summer, we looked at a text in Numbers chapter 11. Um, if you recall, when we looked at Numbers 11, uh, the Israelites were grumbling. They were out in the wilderness. Oh, you remember what it was like when we had all this wonderful food in Egypt? And Moses, as the, the good leader that he is, he throws his hands up. I don't know what to do with this people. They're just grumbling and complaining all the time. I'm sick and tired of this. Just kill me, God. Like That's Moses' take on it. And God says, well, you're going to feed them. You're going to give them enough food for a month. And Moses says, what, how are we going to get enough for all these hundreds of thousands of people million people or whatnot how are we going to how are we going to have enough food for a month are we going to slaughter enough to to feed all these people this is the lord's response to moses the lord said to moses is the lord's power limited or, or literally is his arm too short now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not and actually god's word does come true uh, in the form of quail and it turns out to be really bad for some of the Israelites. That's a whole other thing. Again, we covered that back in the summer. So the principle that, that it forms the basis of what we're studying this morning is that nothing will be impossible with God. As we look at this passage in Luke chapter 1, we're going to consider four impossibilities, if you will. Four impossibilities that are there in the text. Again, remember that principle I'm not denying them at all. What I'm saying is they're impossible from our perspective, but not with God in the picture. And so, what are these impossibilities in the text? The first one, um, I feel like we have to go here. Uh, it's the virgin birth. The virgin birth. Uh, the first impossibility that we're looking at in the text is the virgin birth. Uh, that's the most obvious because this is the one that Mary asked the angel Gabriel about. How can this be? Some commentators have noted we're really talking about the virgin conception, uh, but since it's traditionally called the virgin birth, we'll stick with that. So let's look at the passage together. Verse 26, we see the angel Gabriel, who we, 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 we looked at him last week. The angel Gabriel uh, is sent on another mission. So in last week's passage, he delivered a message to the priest Zacharias. Now we see Gabriel again, uh, and he's coming uh, in the sixth month, meaning the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, as we see in verse 36, uh, he, he visits a city uh, in Galilee called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was not a big, important city like Jerusalem. Right? Last week, Gabriel came to the city of Jerusalem and he delivered a, a message in the temple to the, the priest, uh, Zacharias. The temple was in Jerusalem, not Nazareth. Nazareth was a small town. In fact, in John chapter 1, we get a little bit of a glimpse of what people thought of Nazareth around that general time period. This is years later, but again, the same general time period. John chapter 1, uh, we, we, we read this, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. This is what people thought of Nazareth, right? This is uh, in the new members class was speaking of a particular location that I'll leave unnamed and how some folks 
think of that particular location as the armpit of the area that it's in, right? That's kind of the mentality. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? This, this place is a dump. It's, can, you, can anything good come out of this place? So Gabriel goes to Nazareth. Well, what is he there to do? He's there to visit a young woman, a virgin named Mary, who's engaged to a man named Joseph, who's descended from King David. We see that in the text. Uh, a little explanation might be helpful. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard before that the marriage process in this day was different uh, than it is today. And so when we read there in the text that they were engaged, some of your translations say betrothed because they're pointing out a difference that's there. Uh, the, the betrothal period, it was legally binding, but the couple was not uh, married in the full sense of the word, right? And so the, they were supposed to remain chaste during that betrothal time period. Only when they were fully married would they consummate the marriage. And so the engagement that's spoken of in our text is stronger than our current ones. The, the current engagement can be broken quite easily. Uh, you, you may have even experienced that before. Uh, but to break a betrothal in that day would require a formal divorce. So again, this is stronger than a typical engagement that we're familiar with. Now, we're not told Mary's age in the text, but in all likelihood, based on custom, uh, she was probably quite young, probably a teenager, uh, similar in age to my own sons. And so just kind of thinking through that uh, as I was preparing the sermon this week, what, what, what that would be like, what we're talking about here, the age uh, of Mary. So Gabriel goes to this Mary, and he enters the place where she is, as we read there. Uh, he comes in in verse 28. And he gives her this kind of odd greeting. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, I, I want to pause for a moment uh, and reflect on something that we, thought of, we talked about last week. I, I talked last week about how in the Gospel of Luke, you see Luke using this uh, alternating scheme. And so he talks about John, he talks about Jesus. He talks about John, he talks about Jesus. And there's kind of this alternating pattern that's there. Their birth announcements, their births, their ministries. And over and over again, we see in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is superior to John. John has a purpose, Jesus is superior to John. But when you consider the circumstances surrounding the birth announcement and the birth later on, clearly Gabriel's appearance to Zacharias and in the circumstances of their birth, it's more impressive outwardly what happened with John, right? So what happens in the birth announcement uh, for, for John? Gabriel goes to the city of Jerusalem and he, give, he appears in a vision in the temple to a priest, a, a vocational minister, if you will, in this kind of dramatic fashion during the time where they're, they're offering the incense. And so it's what you would think of as something impressive, spectacular. But here in today's passage, Gabriel goes off to this, this what not well thought of town off the beaten path that has a bad reputation and he seeks out a young teenage girl who's not fully married yet. Do you, do you see the contrast that he's, that's being painted there? Uh, the, there's something of the humility of Christ in all of this. right? He didn't come to impress us outwardly. Right? We think of ha the Son of God coming in, in, in this... Uh, um, we would think of it in certain terms, and it's defied in every, every point. Jesus came... In, in a very humble way. Even his birth announcement shows this. He didn't come to impress us. He came to save us. Right? That's why He came. And we'll consider more of that theme in the coming weeks as we look at the birth narrative. Right? His birth was not this outwardly impressive show. It was at one point when the, the host of angels came, of course. But as far as the circumstances, it, 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 it's, it's pretty humble. And there's a purpose behind that. Now in verse 29, we see that Mary's perplexed about this, this greeting. It's not every day that this happens to you, right? It's not every day that an angel comes and says, Greetings, favored one. That, that doesn't happen. And so she's unsettled by the experience, much like other people are in the Scriptures when an angel comes to them. You're unsettled by this. And Mary's internal struggle is certainly due to the nature of the greeting, but it's also the fact that an angel comes and appears to her. That does not happen every day. 
And no wonder that, that her response is, uh, that Gabriel's response to Mary is similar to what it was to Zacharias. In verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You don't need to be scared. This, this visit is not for your harm, it's actually for your good. And the good is that she would conceive and bear in her womb a son who would be named Jesus. Now, I want to skip over verses 32 and 33 briefly. We're going to come back to that. In verse 34, Mary responds to Gabriel's pronouncement and says, how can this be since I'm, I'm a virgin? Now, I've shared with you before that the world of Bible commentaries is a very interesting place, right? You read some really weird stuff uh, when you study Bible commentaries. Scholars just debate all these issues and when it comes to Mary's question, there's several possible explanations that scholars give for why she responded in this way. I, I, it really seems pretty obvious, honestly. One of them is, is quite obvious. The, the, the obvious answer why she responded this way is that she understood that this was going to take place right away. Right? Scholars are pondering, well, why did she think this? She's already betrothed. She's going to have a man here soon. And I, I mean, She obviously understood that this is about to happen right now. How can this be? I, I, I'm a virgin. This is this. I can't do this. And so she understood that this was going to take place soon. Other explanations that people give have to do with all sorts of different things. The, the Catholic teaching uh, that Mary remained a virgin perpetually and all these other things. But again, it seems obvious to me that that's not the issue. That's not the case. The case is that Mary understood that this was going to happen right away. And since her, her consummation of her marriage would be down the road. This is impossible. It literally is impossible. So how does Gabriel answer her question? Look at verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Now, in no way does this teach some sort of sexual encounter between God and Mary as at least one major cult teaches. That's a pagan idea, right? That's not what we're seeing here in the Bible. Um, also, it's important for us to know that Mary does not receive a rebuke for her question. And what that tells us is Zacharias got rebuked, right? Remember Zacharias last week, Luke 1.18? In Luke 1.18, Zacharias said to the angel, how will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Good question, but Zacharias is essentially looking for a, a sign, right? He's looking for, how am I going to know this for sure? How, tell me, how am I going to know that this is really going to happen? And so his question is, is, in the gospel accounts, many times people ask for signs and they get rebuked for it, right? It's, it's showing some unbelief, some doubt. But that's not the case here with Mary. Mary is accepting, but she has an honest question. How can this be? She's not saying, I, I don't believe you. She's just saying, can you explain to me how this is going to happen? Then in verse 35, we also should note that this child would be described, is described as holy. Right? There's something different about this child. This holy child. Verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And so, certainly this does mean that He was set apart for God's purposes, but it also certainly indicates something about the, the, the character of Christ. Christ is sinless. This is not something that could be said of any other child. And so there you have it, impossibility number one, the virgin birth. Uh, Mary would conceive in a way that's different from anyone else. This never happens. God would do the impossible when He forms this child in her womb without the typical process or components. Now, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the standard passages that get preached at Christmas. Uh, and the virgin birth is there as well. Matthew chapter 1, we can look at that briefly. I don't want to neglect that. Even that, this refers back to Isaiah 7.14, which Mark read earlier. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit, just as we read in Luke there. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. 
But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So here again you have the virgin birth. And it's for that reason, uh, that reason is enough to accept the virgin birth. It's taught in the Scriptures. Right? It's taught in the Scriptures. Uh, I remember getting a question. I think, I think you asked me that question actually. When we came here six years ago, a little over six years ago, what do we think about the virgin birth? Um, it's true because God says it's true, right? It's in the scriptures. And so if it's in God's word, we can accept it as true, regardless of what the world may think about it. It's interesting, though, I've never really had a problem accepting this as true. Um, it is a stumbling block for some. How is it any more unbelievable that a virgin would bear a child uh, than it is that dead people would rise from the grave, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen either. With God it can, and it does, but that, that doesn't happen on a regular basis. Or that fire would fall from heaven when he, the prophet Elijah prayed. I, have you ever, anybody ever seen that? I've never seen, but it happened! Because God can do the impossible. Or how about uh, Daniel's friends surviving a fiery furnace when those people that threw them in died from the heat and they're unscathed, they don't even smell like smoke. How does that happen? Because God did it and God can do the impossible. All things are possible with Him. And so if you say that it's impossible for God to accomplish a virgin birth, I don't know how you can affirm any of the miracles in Scripture. Right? If we start questioning the virgin birth, then, then the question comes up, well, I've never seen a dead person rise up. You ever seen that? Uh, no. Because it doesn't happen, but it will. 1 Corinthians 15, it's going to happen, and it's happened before. God can do the impossible. That's what we read here in the Scriptures. I'd love to kind of go on a rabbit trail and talk about the, the foundation kind of for that. I mean, He's God. He's God. He, he can do whatever He pleases. What we see as laws of nature are just patterns, my friends. God can do whatever He pleases, including the virgin birth. Let's look at a second impossibility in the text. The incarnation. The incarnation. What does that mean? Well, that's the theological term for the coming of Jesus Christ. Now for some, that's really a philosophical impossibility. How can God who is infinite, who is spirit, uh, who is perfect, become a man since we're limited in our fleshly bodies? How can that happen? That doctrine has been a stumbling block for many. And in fact, this is one of the things that sets biblical Christianity apart from other faiths is the incarnation. Uh, in, in pagan mythology, uh, there, there's, there's this, these teachings about people who were part God and part man. So anybody ever heard of Hercules? You remember Hercules? This has been in popular culture. We've seen this. Hercules, according to, to uh, Roman mythology and in Greek before it, he had a different name. Uh, he was a strong man who was supposedly the son of the chief god and a mortal woman. And so he's enjoyed some popularity in American culture. In fact, they even I remember the show from way back when. wouldn't commend it to you, but it's out there. Hey, what Hercules supposedly was is not the same as what the Bible teaches about Jesus. Okay, Hercules and these other myth mythological creatures or, or people or whatever you want to call them, we're supposedly part God and part man. But the Bible shows us, and the church has historically affirmed through prominent creeds and confessions, that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. Right? Theologians call this hypostatic union. He's not part God, part man. He's fully God and He's fully man. And again, we could parse the language there. That's at least implied in the text this morning. Verse 32 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Well, he's called the Son of the Most High, 
That's not something that any other person could take in a normal sense, right? We don't go around saying, so-and-so is son of the Most High. That's not, that title doesn't go for anyone else, only with Jesus. That, there's something divine in that title. But then you think about the, the manner of Jesus coming. Obviously, He's a man, right? He's, he's born into the world just like we, we are or we were. And, and so, again, Jesus is not part God, part man. He's fully God, fully man. The Gospel of John does not contain a birth narrative in the same way that Matthew and Luke do. But the first chapter of John does make a powerful statement on the Incarnation. Again, this is something that's impossible from a human perspective. John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Skip down same chapter to verse 14. And the Word that we just read about became flesh. What are we talking about here? We're talking about God's Son. We're talking about Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I preached on John 1 and part of this passage on Christmas Eve four years ago. And the, the sermon was, What Happened in the Incarnation? Here's some of what I said in that, that time. I said, The Son of God, who has existed eternally, took on human flesh and became a man. It wasn't just that He appeared to be a man. No, He quite literally became a man so that He would be both fully God and fully man. Now, that may be a bit difficult to grasp, uh, but indeed, that is what we celebrate at Christmas. All of the Christmas stories that you've heard before about Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, are describing what happened around the time when the Son of God took on flesh. Baby Jesus was indeed God in human flesh. And that, once again, is what we mean by the Incarnation. This is impossible from a human perspective. How does an infinite God take on flesh and become a man? How does that happen? How is one person fully God and fully man? God did that. Because why? All things are possible with Him. All things. Nothing's impossible with God. Virgin birth. Incarnation. Impossible with humans. Not with God. Third impossibility in our text this morning. The Messiah ruling as Son of David. The Messiah ruling as Son of David. Look back at verses 32 and 33. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. And He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and His kingdom will have no end. Now that may sound like what's the big deal there, Pastor Kevin? I don't get it. Well, if you're familiar with the historical storyline of the Bible, it is a big deal. In fact, it's impossible like the virgin birth and the incarnation. Let me elaborate for a little bit. David was Israel's greatest king. You probably know him from the account of uh, David and Goliath or something along those lines. And so David was Israel's greatest king. He came, he reigned, and he brought in this period of peace and prosperity uh, that flowered fully under his son Solomon. You can read about in the book of First and Second Samuel, David was the greatest king every Israel ever had. But there was a little problem in Mary's day. right? We're talking about a thousand years later. There's a little problem in Mary's day. The house of Jacob, or Israel as Jacob was also called, was under the control of the mighty Roman Empire. And so Israel was not a, a powerful nation or even a free nation. It was under the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was not about to give up control to anyone. So to say that someone was going to reign over the house of Jacob, that was not going to happen under Rome's dominion. Uh, the, the Romans did sometimes use puppet kings like they did with Herod. We talked about that last week. But Herod was not descended from David. And Herod was not about to share his throne with anybody. That's why when you read Matthew's Gospel, what does he do when he hears about uh, the, the Messiah, he tries to kill him. And in fact, he doesn't just try to kill Jesus. He's like, well, just let's, make, let's just make sure, just kill all the babies that are age two and under. So he's not about to share. His, that's horrific. 
right? That should rub us the wrong way. We think about that slaughtering uh, infants. That's horrible. He's not going to share his glory with anyone. And so in no way, shape, or form was this something that was conceivable that someone was going to assume David's throne when Rome was overall in control, not going to share that power. And what they did share was under someone like Herod, who was a brutal murderer. And at this point, David's line was dead for all intents and purposes. It's not that he didn't have any living descendants, right? We're told that Joseph is a descendant of David in the text. But David's descendants had been out of power for almost 600 years at this point. Almost 600 years at this point. It, put that in context. What's six? I can do the math, right? What's this year, 2021? So 1421. <laughs> That's a long time ago. This is a completely different historical context. That period of time, roughly, David's descendants had been out of power. And so again, this is a big deal. They certainly weren't ruling the people of Israel, but God is not only able to do the impossible, God also keeps His promises. Right? If God says this is going to happen, then it will happen. And so theologians point to something that God said to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. It says, your house, God speaking to David, says, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Forever. Wait a minute, it didn't look like that happened. It looked like David and his descendants were out of power. Well, some of that context there in 2 Samuel 7 and also in 1 Chronicles 17 is referring to David's son Solomon, but Solomon's not going to rule forever, right? Somebody else would have to do that. So who could reign forever? Someone who was the son of David, Jesus Christ? That For him to reign forever would require that he lives forever. And when you are resurrected from the dead, you've defeated death, you're going to live forever. And so he can reign forever. Now, what about the fact that David's line had ceased to reign? Well, that was a problem, humanly speaking. But God knew that this was going to happen. And in fact, God had addressed this issue even before David's line uh, was cut off in the Babylonian captivity. Isaiah chapter 11, we've looked at this before as a congregation too. Then a shoot will spring from the stem or the stump of Jesse, that was David's dad, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked." Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. The picture here is a, a tree stump cut down. Anybody got any stumps in their yard? You got tree stumps? I got, I got some stumps in, in my yard. Um, they're, they're, they're dead. They're rotting. One of them's rotting. Like stuff's coming out of it and whatnot. It's just a rotting stump. It's dead. Out of the stem or the stump of Jesse, a shoot's going to spring forth. Something's going to come out of that. And that something is going to rule and reign, and that is Jesus. So what appeared to be dead would come back to life in the One who would rule forever, the Messiah, Jesus. And so again, impossible, but not with God. Impossibility number four this morning. The Gospel. The Gospel. Now, this impossibility is not covered explicitly in the text today, but it's easy to get there if you simply ask a question. Why? Right? Why? Why was Jesus coming? Why was Jesus coming? Why would the virgin bear a child? Why would God take on flesh? Why would this child be given the throne of his father David? And the answer there is found in a verse that we've looked at many times over the last six years here. 1 Timothy chapter 1 Verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, the Apostle Paul writes, that Christ Jesus came into the world to be a really nice guy. 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to do some miracles. That Christ Jesus came into the world to eat some really great Middle Eastern food. That Christ... No! The text is clear. Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners, among whom I, the Apostle Paul says, am the foremost of all. Why is it that Paul said Jesus came into the world to save sinners? And so here is the impossibility, my friends. How can sinful people be reconciled to a holy, righteous God? That is impossible with men. Jesus says it Himself. Luke chapter 18. We looked at this briefly earlier. Let me set a little bit of a larger context there. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is to the rich young ruler who rejected the appeal of Christ. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, then, then who can be saved? But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. It's very interesting to me, that passage. Um, sometimes you hear these bizarre explanations about, well, it's really difficult. Uh, there, there was this gate and the camel had to kind of squirrel, like go through. I, I think they're missing the point. Jesus is saying something and the disciples are shocked by it. Because they're like, if that's the case, then who can be saved? Jesus says, with man it's impossible, but not with God. And it's interesting, if you look at the larger context in Luke's Gospel, and you read that statement, very shortly after that, we see someone who's very wealthy, very rich, entering the kingdom of God, coming to faith, being saved. Zacchaeus, right? He was despised, hated. The, I don't, I, that's not an accident that Luke puts that almost right after this statement. You want to see something that's impossible? I'm going to show you this. Zacchaeus, this despised chief tax collector, hated, wealthy individual, despised by everyone, comes to faith. Even Zacchaeus can be saved. How? Because nothing's impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. You know, who is it that we think is impossible I think sometimes we get on our high horse and we just think like, well, uh, you know, God saved me, but I don't know if God can save that person. I think if that's what we're thinking, we have too high of an opinion of ourselves, to be honest with you. Right? Well, that person couldn't be saved. Well, if you could be saved, how come that person couldn't be saved? You know, maybe we overestimate our own I don't know what you would say, uh, our, the, the depth of our own sin. I think the Scriptures are pretty clear about this, my friends. Our sin deserves God's judgment and wrath. It doesn't deserve, we don't deserve anything. And so if God can save this nasty wretch, then God can save anybody. And I think the Scriptures bear witness to this. Right? The Apostle Paul is is out there trying to kill Christians and put them in jail. And God says, You, you, sir, are going he didn't say sir, are, are going to be my spokesman to the Gentiles. You uh, who are steeped in the law, who would detest to be with Gentiles, you are going to be the one who goes and preaches the gospel to the Gentiles. God can save anyone. Moses is a murderer. He is quite literally a killer. He's a murderer. And God says, you're going to be the one who's going to lead my people out of Egypt into the promised land, or at least to the edge of the promised land. You're the one. God! How can you? It's God! Right? Every single time someone is saved, it is a miracle because God saves sinners. The Gospel is impossible with man. But with God, all things are possible. And I stand before you as one who was saved by the grace of God. My friends, what we need is a Savior. We need a Savior. Jesus didn't sin like we do. He wasn't a sinner. And yet, He, he willingly gave Himself to absorb the wrath that, that we deserve. 
right? And then He rose from the dead. My friends, He's the only hope for anyone this morning. Now, you may be sitting here or you may be watching because you're curious online and you're, you're, you're thinking, yeah, all this stuff is impossible. Maybe entertaining, but impossible. It's not real. Right? Virgins don't have babies. God doesn't become a man. In fact, I don't even know if God exists. And, and kings don't rule forever, so you can forget about this gospel stuff. If that's what you're thinking this morning, what I would encourage you to contemplate is what if you're wrong? Right? What if you're wrong? What if Mary really did have a baby named, Je- named Jesus despite the fact that she was a virgin? And what if the Son of God really did take on flesh and come to earth? And what if He gave Himself on a Roman cross and He rose from the dead such that He'll reign not only over Israel but over all creation forever? If all that is true, then what else is true? The fires of hell and the wrath of God. That's true because we read it in the Scriptures. His judgment on sinners. That puts things in perspective, does it not? If these things are true, then what else is true? All things are possible with God. My friends, God did do these things. And God will do that. And you say, what do I do? My friends, there's hope because there's still time. There's still breath in your lungs. There's still breath in your lungs. Call out to Christ and cling to His mercies. My friends, if God can save Paul and He can save Moses and He can save David, He can save this wretch, He can save anyone. Call out to Christ. Repent and believe, the Bible says. My friends, I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you about this. If you're listening online, I'd love to connect with you and talk to you about the hope that's only found in Christ. Let's get to the last part here for just a minute. What's the right response? Right, what's the right response to the God who can do all things? Faith and submission. Faith and submission. Faith and submission. How does Mary respond? Verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Right, how do we respond to the God who can do all things? Faith and submission. That's how we respond. Is this going to be our response, church? Will we trust God when it seems impossible to obey Him because something is crushing us, a crisis in our lives? Will we submit to His instruction and His Word even when it will cost us? Right? It's going to cost you to follow Christ. Not in the way that the world would say it. I think we understand that. Or are we going to resist Him and try to retain control of our our own lives in spite of the fact that we not only can't do the impossible, we can't do the impossible, we can't do a lot of things that are just difficult. Are we going to respond in faith and submission? And in this sense, Mary is a wonderful example for us to follow. And so the question for us then this morning is how are we going to respond to the One who can do all things? Will we respond like Mary Or will we respond like someone else with doubt or even unbelief? I pray that we would respond like Mary um, in faith and submission to the one who can do all things. Let's pray. Father, we readily confess that you are able to do all things. You can heal the sick and raise the dead. You can, through your spirit, you can overshadow the Virgin Mary and bring about the birth of of your son, Jesus. You can save sinners. Lord, you truly can do all things. And so... We worship You this morning. We confess that we are sometimes a doubtful people. And sometimes we were tempted to respond in unbelief to You. Lord, be merciful to us, we pray. And strengthen our faith. 
That when we see or experience what we feel are impossible circumstances in our own lives and even, even in our collective life as a church, that we would respond as Mary did. We are Your bondservants. Let it be unto us as You please, Lord. You're a good God and we entrust our lives to You. That God strengthen us that we would believe You when You tell us that all things are possible with You. We pray it in Christ's name.